I'm Peter Duben, and I'm working at Eastern WF. And um, for those of you who have been at the first um, lecture today with Thomas Schulteis, Eastern WF is, was the institute he was mentioned to be responsible for HPC and weather and climate in the future. So that's kind of, uh, sorry, this one. And that's the one where I'm working at. And basically, we are a research institute, but we also have an um, operational weather forecast 24-7. Um, and our kind of weather forecast reach into the so-called mid-range, which means a couple of days into the future. But we also cover uh, monthly and seasonal predictions. Um, we are an independent intergovernmental organization. Um, we are supported by 34 member states. And there's a, um, well, a map of those states up on the right here. And we're based in the UK. We have 350 members of staff, approximately from 30 different countries. And the real reason why we are there is actually because those member states basically came together a couple of decades ago and, and said, like, OK, operational weather forecast is going to be really difficult if you want to kind of look more than one or two days into the future, because it needs to be global. And you have a lot of data. And there's no point in having like um, 34 different models to kind of save the same purpose. So basically, we kind of collected forces and uh, the European Weather Center was, found, found, um, was founded. And as Thomas uh, kind of mentioned in his, his talk already, we're actually quite good. So we're kind of doing a quite good job in predicting, for example, tropical cyclones. And they're kind of in, among the world leaders in this perspective, and also in other perspectives as well. So predicting weather and climate, why is it actually so difficult? Um, this is a picture which was taken at the Apollo 17 mission. And it just shows the Earth. And it kind of already demonstrates a lot of the complexity and problems that we have when we want to predict into, um, weather and climate into the future. So the first thing you see is that it's just quite big. And that's not like the best thing, like the best property of a system if you want to perform um, numerical simulations. The other thing that you see is that it's quite kind of complex. You have an ocean that you need to represent. You have an atmosphere that you need to represent. You have, for example, things like sea ice. You have all sorts of different cloud patterns that you need to represent. You have also like um, land and topography. And you have like um, different land surfaces, like the tropics or a desert or mountain range or whatever. And you need to represent all of those processes and quite accurately, actually, if you want to kind of look into the future of weather and climate. So it's going to, all of those are going to impact the simulations. And another thing that you see is that you also have like a very fine-grained filamentation here, for example. So it's actually like a turbulent flow as well. So it's really like a nonlinear system with nonlinear interactions between the different components. And we really have um, the problem of a turbulent system to, to simulate. Um, another big thing that makes it quite difficult is that a lot of the properties that we actually need to kind of really represent in our systems to perform good weather and climate predictions are very small scales. So if you think, for example, of clouds, like in particular convective clouds that are kind of going deep up in the atmosphere, they're really important to kind of drive the energy circulation in the atmosphere. But they are kind of also quite small scale if you compare it. Um, in a typical weather model, we would have a resolution of around 5 to 10 kilometers. In a climate model, we, offer, we would have a resolution of like 50 to 100 kilometers. And you can imagine that, for example, clouds that are really important are not really um, represented explicitly in those simulations. So they're just too small scale, really. And um, then if you don't have clouds, you don't really get the interactions, for example, between radiations and clouds correctly. Um, and also, you have things like the turbulent boundary layer close to the surface, which is really just like a, a turbulent three-dimensional fluid, if you want. Um, and if you just think about a 10-kilometer resolution, that's kind of quite not the ideal situation. And um, then you have topography, for example. If you think about the Alps, if you kind of represent the Alps in a 50-kilometer grid, I mean, the, there's not much left of that. So really, resolution is a big problem because we can't really resolve a lot of the processes explicitly. So the Earth is complex, it's chaotic, it's huge, and we do not have sufficient resolution to um, resolve all important processes. However, we're still doing a quite good job in terms of our models are actually already kind of quite complex. So this is a, a plot that shows the cloud content um, in a simulation of a one kilometer resolution over the, um, over the atmosphere, which was done by Niels Vidi at our, at our center. And you can see that a lot of the structures that you've seen in the satellite picture before are already kind of within, those, um, within this picture, and that we really kind of are already like representing a very fine-grained um, picture of, of, the, of what's, what is going on and kind of what may be going on in the future. And the limitation of this, this figure here is really not the resolution of the model, but the um, resolution of the projector here and also the, the size of the, um, the file that I could put into the presentation. So like a one kilometer resolution simulation of the Earth is really like something that has a lot of degrees of freedoms and already kind of uh, is stretching the limits of what we can do. 
So, high performance computing and system modeling. Um, first of all, I want to stress, and again, Thomas kind of gave a very good introduction this morning, that weather and climate model is already a high performance computing application. So at the European Weather Center, for example, we have two supercomputers, and they both rank within the top 30 of the, of the top 500 lists. So we really kind of already at the limit in terms of like high performance computing. It's not that we should just kind of scale up on bigger systems and be happy. And we kind of already know also what we do. So we also have like a lot of computing scientists at our center. It's not that we kind of come from some outside field and just kind of experience HPC at the moment. The forecast quality is going to depend on resolution and complexity. That's what I already talked about in the last slide. The resolution will depend on the performance of supercomputers that we have. And we're facing the typical problems that the community, HPC community is facing at the moment. For example, that individual processors are not going to be faster. So if you want to speed up a single simulation, you have to parallelize. Um, and if you kind of go up to like a million processing units in parallel, it is kind of quite a good bit engineering exercise. Um, so basically, this means that we need to make our models fit to kind of really scale to this huge number of processors. And that's like, a, like an ongoing process at the moment. Um, but the other problem, obviously, is that also the power consumption is going to, and my pointer is dying, I think, um, the power consumption is going to be a bigger and bigger problem as you kind of scale to more processes, obviously. And we're already reaching the problem that we basically have to move the supercomputers because we can't really provide the infrastructure at the side that we have at the moment, um, just in terms of power and space and everything. So um, as a lot of people kind of summarize this fact, is basically the free lunch is over. Um, we can't just wait for five years, buy a new supercomputer, and be happy. We really have to work hard to get the most out of the existing HPC infrastructure. Um, this is just a plot to scale like the, the individual problems that we have in our community more. So on the left, you see um, a plot of the scalability of our systems as you kind of go to other resolution levels. So on the x I axis, you see the resolution. So the 10 kilometer is where we are at the moment in, in weather forecasts, but the one kilometer is really where we want to be because we would know that a step change would actually take place in terms of uncertainty. And the, the reason is because if you go to one kilometer, so you can represent a lot of those processes that I had on the second slide, um, like for example, deep convecting clouds and all these kind of things um, explicitly, and this would really reduce the uncertainty that we have in both weather and climate simulations. However, it's still a long way to go. So on the y-axis, you see the number of um, compute costs, but also basically the power consumption. And as you see, there are two modes of, of weather forecasts. One is that you have only one single um, forecast, which is kind of giving you the best picture possible at the highest resolution, and it's kind of scaling up here. And the other one is that you have an ensemble simulation, so you have 50 ensemble members that you run in parallel to get like a probability distributions of the future. And you see, obviously, that those things are kind of, kind of scaling up quite high um, towards the one kilometer gauge. So this is kind of a big problem for us. We really kind of try hard to kind of get to this range. So one of the biggest problems in our community really is that we have a huge code base. So the app system is very complex, as I've talked and, and told you before. And therefore, we really have models that have like millions of lines of code. And um, this is basically Fortran code. But it doesn't really matter what it is. If you have a million lines of code, it's going to be difficult to kind of port your model just to another hardware. Um, it's also a very data intensive field. So basically, um, a lot of the, the uh, bottleneck is really the memory and the cache optimization and kind of the data that needs to be transported between different nodes. So the difficult, it's very difficult for us to reach peak performance. And actually, we're doing not a very good job, even though we try very hard. So we typically reach like something like 5% of peak performance of a typical system. Um, Another thing which is, makes things difficult is that we have global scale interactions, which basically means that if you want to make one, weather for, one day weather forecast, you're probably fine with like a local model. But if you, for example, want to look three or five or 10 days into the future, into the future you really need to kind of um, make sure that we represent all the different scales in the system. And for the Earth, this basically means that you need a global simulation. So actually, something that is happening on the other side of the Earth can have an impact on a five-day weather forecast at your side of the Earth. So you really need kind of the entire system. And the entire data of the system also needs to be able to communicate basically within one time step. And therefore, there's just a lot of communication going on. And therefore, it's difficult to paralyze our applications to a large extent. And another thing which is kind of making things more interesting is also that there are obviously operational deadlines. So typically, we, need, we can only use a couple of hours to actually collect all the data. And we're talking about like 300 to 600 million data observations that reach ECNWF every day. And then process this data, put it into a weather for, um, uh, make a data simulation to put the data into the, system, into the model, and then run the model. And all of this needs to be done in, in a window of like a couple of hours. And this is obviously also kind of difficult if you just want to kind of go for throughput and not for um, time to solution and to reduce power. 
So basically, we are at a stage now where we really have to work hard to make our models more scalable. And Eastern WF is kind of one of the, the big centers who have these problems, but it's really a community effort for, all, for many different operational weather forecast centers in Europe. And therefore, we now have also like a couple of European Union projects. And I just want to focus on the escape project on the left here. The point is really not really working very well. Um, but also, there's, for example, a center of excellence, Easy Ways, which is going to be pushing like um, high performance capabilities in Earth system modeling. And um, the route that we're kind of going down <coughs> with this K project is that we, we have those, this used code base. And what we do is we now encapsulate like parts that are very expensive, um, but have like a rather small code base and isolate them such that you can run them offline of the normal weather forecast model. And we call them the weather and climate dwarfs. And the, um, I'm going to have another slide um, in a second on this one. The second step, obviously, is to kind of push everything in towards the main specific languages. And the group around um, Thomas Schultes, uh, CSCS, and Mentor Swiss have really done a great job to kind of push this into the field um, more and more to make our models more portable and also kind of to unify um, the, the language between different models. And obviously, um, we also have to develop new algorithms to be kind of really extremely scalable into the future. And particular elliptic solvers are a problem for time stepping schemes, but also in terms of, of, of spatial discretization, you really need to think about um, more better algorithms to scale. So those dwarf, how do, do, does it actually work? You kind of start from this complex system on the left, and then you kind of isolate those very expensive um, dwarf well, components of the model system itself, make it possible to run it um, offline and elsewhere. And then you, those dwarfs can be ported to the different hardware architectures. Um, you can also kind of redevelop the dwarfs in terms of that you improve the algorithms that are work, um, used. And at the end, hopefully, we get like dwarfs that are much faster. And then we can kind of put them back into the um, complex system with all, with all its beauty. And um, this kind of works quite well. And I'm going to show you kind of one example for this, um, which is the transform dwarf on GPUs. Um, at Eastern WF, we work with a so-called spectral model. And spectral models kind of, de um, kind of develop the physical fields into sets of basis functions on the sphere. So it's basically like a Fourier decomposition on the sphere. And you kind of make a lot of computation in spectral space, which is very efficient. But the problem is that you need to transform between spectral space and grid point space in every grid point uh, at every time step. And this requires an, a fast Fourier transformation, but also a Legendre transformation. And this Legendre transformation scales with the number of degrees of freedom cubed. So basically, this means it gets worse and worse as you go to higher resolution. And as you go to higher resolution, the ratio of the Legion transformation is going to take over in, in, in comparison to the rest of the model. So the transformation actually represents a significant fraction of the computing cost that we have in our system. And now the question is, can we use GPUs to speed up the transform dwarf in particular, just to kind of a good startup to, to get into GPU computing? And the, these are the results um, that, are, that kind of, well, have been generated by Alan Gray and Peter Mesmer, both for Nvi NVIDIA, because NVIDIA is actually a partner in this K project. And they looked into the transform dwarf. And they started, the original implementation of the dwarf is somewhere down here. And this is kind of the typical roof line plot that you get for um, a Pascal 100 GPU. Um, and you basically, you optimize commutation and, and everything, and you basically kind of are able to actually kind of increase, increase efficiency in the GPU by a factor of 10. <clears throat> and if you just look into the, the Legendre transformation, which is likely to be the most important problem in the future, you're kind of getting even, even further up and further to the right. Um, the red dots are for a resolution which was typically used in climate simulations. We are more on the weather side, more focusing on the, on the black dots. And you can, even, you can also see that if you go to high resolution, you actually kind of improve yourself in the roofline plot, which is good news. And, um, so this is like the, the blue, black dots are now what we kind of the resolution we're working with in operational weather forecasts, and if you kind of um, just focus on the mat, mat mul, um kind of just just well a single operation, but which is actually the most important one for the John transformation itself, we actually kind of very close to peak performance now. So that's good news in terms of um, well that the, the the outline of this project really helped to kind of help um, to, to look into those different components. And this is basically the same result, but in a different way to present it. So this is time to, um, the time that it was used, if you take the original code, if you optimize for commutation, if you optimize for commutation and communication, and there's a difference between no peer-to-peer -to -peer or peer-to-peer. -peer. So basically, the, the right columns or, um, use basic, um, communication via NVLink between GPUs. And you can see that we're now really kind of talking about an um, increase of, of commutation of a factor of 56, as long as you can put everything onto one node, which is may or may not be possible. But still, these are really interesting um, results for us. OK, 
Another topic of this talk is basically um, a reduction in numerical precision because we looked into this kind of quite heavily recently. The idea is that the um, that if you kind of reduce precision, you're basically going to be more um, have more and more performance available. Um, weather and climate models are based on double precision for decades, so it was really something well perfectly new to, to us to look into it again. We have probably done this 30 years ago, but not really. Um, recently, because we, we, maybe we have been so lucky to just have enough computation anyway. But if you reduce numeric position, you're going to go to lower power and higher performance. You can go to high resolution, increased complexity, and hopefully you'll get better predictions. And if you think about the temperature in Munich, for example, there's no intuitive reason to kind of represent temperature with a temperature in double position with 15 digits, because you're not going to be able to, to, to measure it or predict it in this position anyway. So single position may be possible, but why not even kind of try half position, for example? There are also different ways to kind of do this now, double single half position, and NVIDIA, is, again, like, um, has kind of really pushed half position, which is really interesting for us in the last years. Um, you can obviously reduce precision data storage. You can, if you really like a painful work, you can also work with um, field programmable gate arrays. And, but there's kind of more on the horizon, really, because there's now this bottleneck of computing and the speed up that we can expect. So, Precision is very much linked to uncertainty as well. And if you think about like, how we actually represent uncertainties in weather forecasts, this is kind of just one slide to, to, to give you an outline about this. If you have a forecast of temperature, and this is just data that are made up for like a 10-day forecast, um, to really know whether you have been right or wrong, you can just kind of wait for 10 days and plot the weather into the same scale, and you will know whether you had a good, good forecast or a bad forecast. But you really want to know this at the very beginning of the forecast. If you, for example, think about a trajectory of a hurricane, you don't only want to know the most likely case where it's going to hit the coastline, but you really want to understand the, the distribution where it may hit the coastline. And you kind of get this uncertainty range by running the model not only once, but a couple of times in a so-called ensemble. And this is basically helping you because the spread of the ensemble is going to tell you something about the uncertainty that you can predict in this weather forecast. And this is exactly what we're doing. So this is like the temperature forecast for Munich from Monday. And you see those blue boxes there. And basically, we have run an ensemble of forecasts, meaning like 51 um, simulations. And the blue boxes do tell you about the spread of this ensemble. And you see that they're very small at the beginning. But in the end, they're kind of getting bigger and bigger. And they can actually kind of be bigger and then kind of get smaller again. So uncertainty is really something which is regime dependent. And this is really the way that we actually um, diagnose uncertainty in our predictions. And the big question is now, will our simulation that reduces precision actually change the ensemble spread? It's going to almost certainly going to change the individual forecast itself. There's no question. It's a chaotic system. But the question is actually, like, as long as we stay in this uncertainty range of the ensemble forecast, we can reduce precision without being, being penalized in, in terms of the quality of solutions. And we've done a couple of um, studies here. So, uh, and I'm actually running out of time, apparently. Um, so this is a, a study that we performed with a spectral dynamical core, where we don't have like physics, we don't have clouds, we don't have water vapor, but we still have like um, three-dimensional dynamics of the system over the sphere, and quite quite a, quite a re um, real one in terms of, in comparison to the atmosphere. And we reduce precision now on a software emulator to only eight bits in the significant. And if you do this, you will learn something about the impact of the, the precision reduction, but you won't learn some, anything about the cost that is related with this, because the, the software emulation is going to reduce speed and not increase. So we work together with computing scientists to actually get like, estimates of the savings that we can expect. And these are the results. So if you run at high resolution in double position, the normalized energy demand is going to be 1. And the forecast error for one of the big quantities we look into is 2.3. If you reduce resolution, um, still keep double position, you're going to reduce your energy demand by a factor of two, but the forecast error is going to increase. And if, on the other hand, you just keep resolution high, but reduce precision to only eight bits in the significant, energy demand is going to be increased even further, but the forecast error is going to be much more similar to the original value. So it's much better to actually reduce precision and then to go to higher resolution, it seems. And also, this tells us that maybe the floating point standard is not kind of really like very flexible enough for us and if you kind of want to really kind of push this to the very limit. Um, and we have also performed studies with real hardware, meaning FPGAs, um, and basically they confirmed the results. It's, there's a lot to, to get by reduced precision and get higher performance. I'm really going to run through this slide, I guess. Um, obviously, the first step to do is to kind of push from double position to single position, and that what, what, that's what I've done in, the, in, the, in our forecast model, and we really kind of have now a setup <coughs> where you can run the same simulation in single position instead of double position, and this is a reference basically for a five-day forecast, and you see that they are kind of really indistinguishable in terms of quality. 
However, we get a 40% speed up on our, our Cray supercomputer, which is kind of big money if you think that this model is basically the main, main tool which is running on, this, um, on the two, com two supercomputers that we have. And it will also help you to push to high resolution, in particular because you can fit more, because you reduce the memory size of a factor of two, and basically can use like, much more, a much smaller portion of a supercomputer for a single a simulation. And just like a, a very quick run through deep learning and weather forecasts, <coughs> the question is obviously for us, can neural networks be used for global weather predictions? And I looked into this a bit at least, and we performed actually model uh, simulations, or we, we, we performed predictions with a toy model, which is kind of generating like, well, which is our first step into every new method, basically, um, to kind of see whether neural networks would be able to kind of make predictions in this, in this kind of nonlinear world. And I was, I have to say, I was quite impressed. They were doing a very good job in terms of that you could run actually kind of climate type simulations based on neural networks and kind of produce very reasonable um, probability distributions, but also um, correlation in space and time. However, the, if you just wanted to make predictions, um, they were still far off in terms of the forecast model, that, um, forecast error that you would have in comparison to the dynamical model. And I think, even though this is just a toy model, I think it's kind of still like a very fair point to say um, that you, it's probably going to very, be very difficult to just kind of make global predictions with a neural network just because of the complexity of the system. This may not be true for a very lo local scale um, short-term weather predictions that are kind of based on a couple of local observations, but really for, for big-time weather predictions, it's going to be difficult. So um, it's also fair to say that there's only 40 years of satellite data. So if you think about um, the amount of data, it's enormous that we have for the atmosphere, but we only have like a certain set of the time frame, which is going to make it difficult to train networks. So I'm pretty confident that Google is not, go not going to make me unemployed in the next couple of years. However, we really think there's a lot of scope to use neural networks um, for weather forecasting. And the, the main way we want to use those networks is basically um, to replace existing model components to speed up simulations. So if you have a model component which is kind of, can be to some extent separated, you can train a neural network to do exactly the same job as this model component, but just much, much, much more quicker. And then you can make the trade-off between position and performance again, so you basically you kind of be faster, so you can reinvest the savings and improve your model setup. And this has actually been done at Eastern WF in operational weather forecasts for the radiation part um, almost 20 years ago, which is kind of quite impressive, I think. Um, but they have stopped at one point because the neural network couldn't represent the nonlinearity non of the system when they upgraded the system at one point. But this is kind of probably not true anymore because neural networks had kind of quite a push in the last 20 years. So um, we now really expect that they, they are much better to represent those nonlinear features. So <coughs> we want to... And repeat this exercise basically to kind of train a neural network for um, to rip, rip, um, well to replace the existing model components in a particular variation scheme. And this is work we want to do, and we will we will be doing together with Nvidia and Christoph Angara and Peter Mesmer in a, in a collaboration. Okay, um, these are the conclusions. I don't think it makes sense to really read them out, so I just leave them for you to read. And thank you for your attention. <laughs>